welcome back to DBX Labs. The compound that we are going to synthesize today is known as tetrazine. We are going to make tetrazine today by reacting amino guanidine bicarbonate with sodium nitrite in a solution of weak, uh, weak acetic acid. Typically, in this synthesis, glacial acetic acid is used and diluted in water. I uh, thought that I might be able to substitute that glacial acetic acid, even though I do have some um, right here. I don't have very much of it, and I am substituting it for vinegar uh, because I did the calculations right here, um, and uh, ends up that um, the vinegar is actually too concentrated to use um, plain in this uh, synthesis. So that really shows you how weak this solution is going to have to be um, uh, in order to run this synthesis properly. Tetrazine is used as a sensitizer to sensitize explosives that would otherwise be too iner uh, inert or insensitive um, for most uses as an explosive. Uh, it is used in, um, in a mix with RDX um, to make C4, um, well, along with other stuff, but um, uh, it, it alone also is an energetic, and we're going to look into those properties uh, today and see how it burns, um, what rate it deflagrates, and if it detonates at all. Unlike rhodonide synthesis of tetrazine, which is also on YouTube, this synthesis will use common household vinegar as its source of acetic acid. Uh, vinegar has a concentration of roughly 6.5% um, uh, acetic acid by, by mass. Um, so that means that I had to do the, uh, the calculations to determine how much vinegar we're going to need to use versus how much um, water we're going to have to dilute it with. Uh, so we can reach the same ratio of acetic acid to water that he reached in his uh, video, which was based off of the procedure outlined by PubChem. My improvised procedure, which I have outlined, calls for 242 milliliters of household vinegar, 458 milliliters of distilled water, and uh, 34 grams of amino guanidine bicarbonate and 27.6 grams of sodium nitrite. To start off, we measure out 458 milliliters of distilled water and we add 242 milliliters of household vinegar. Since they add up to about 700 milliliters, I'm just going to fill up to that line. Now I would like to say that this is my first time running the reaction with vinegar instead of glacial acetic acid diluted into water. Uh, I don't know how well it will work. Um, if you watch to the end of the video, you'll know better than I do right now, but um, uh, it should work because one thing I learned uh, while doing a little bit of research about uh, um, vinegar for this video is Vinegar actually um, is made by diluting um, manufactured acetic acid because the, the way um, acetic acid is, is extracted is uh, through distillation um, and in that case it is glacial acetic acid um, which is a azeotrope with something like 99.5% glacial acetic acid and like the 0.5% is water, but um, in this case, I'm using vinegar, which should be pure acetic acid because all it was was diluted um, before, well, in the process of turning into usable vinegar, which is commonly used in households for cleaning and um, culinary stuff. So we'll continue assuming that this is pure acetic acid. 
I would also like to say that if you uh, plan on doing the procedure um, uh, after watching this video and would like to stick to the, the method uh, used by rhodonide, um, the route in which I created my own glacial acetic acid was um, through the distillation of the product of reacting uh, sodium acetate anhydrous with um, vinegar. Uh, no, not with vinegar, with, um, uh, with concentrated sulfuric acid. Now, I know that the concentrated sulfuric acid I used um, is not 100% Sulf, uh, I mean, uh, not 98% sulfuric acid. Um, it is something around 91 or 92%. Um, that's what I got after doing the titration of it. Um, but in my purposes, it's really negligible um, because, I mean, it the, the yield turns out well in this reaction regardless. And um, it it really doesn't matter how much you you screw up the um, the procedure uh, it, it, it's a very simple procedure and um, the reaction runs smoothly nonetheless we then add a large stir bar with 34 grams of weighed out aminoglenadine bicarbonate we begin the additions to the solution of weak acetic acid keep in mind that this is a carbon bicarbonate neutralization reaction and lots of CO2 will be released so be very careful and proceed with caution. We are doing in this step is converting the aminoguanidine bicarbonate into a soluble salt of aminoguanidine, which is aminoguanidine acetate, which, with heating in our next step, should dissolve into solution. We now begin heating the solution until it becomes clear. The aminoguanidine has dissolved completely, so we will now turn off heating and wait for the solution to cool to 30 degrees Celsius. Now that we have reached right around 30 degrees Celsius, we add all of the 27.6 grams of sodium nitrite into the solution at once. We now let the solution mix and all of the sodium nitrite should dissolve fairly quickly. What's interesting about this step is it is a diazination, but typically diazinations have to be constantly watched because you can have a runaway diazination. I know Reactive Chem put one on his channel as a demonstration, but they're, they're just nasty in, in, um, accidents to have in a lab where you have massive amounts of uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, no, not, not nitrous oxide, my, my, my bad. Um, uh, nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide coming out of solution, filling the, the lab with noxious fumes. Not a good scenario, so it's interesting to to see that there's nothing coming out of this. It's it's really an easy uh, procedure overall. There's nothing on here that uh, that really has to be too um, uh, you have to be too careful about. I mean, you should be very careful with every step along the way. But like, there's nothing that's something to worry about. And I guess that's a good thing. And let, unless you like um, left on the, the hot plate and it was heating up while you were um, adding the sodium nitrite, there's nothing that could really go wrong with this procedure because it's so simple.
it worked so smoothly. So at this point, we just let the solution sit um, as it cools down. Um, it uh, as it cools down from 30 degrees Celsius, more and more of the tetrazine will start to precipitate out. And uh, I think at this point, I'll leave you guys with a um, a time lapse of the tetrazine precipitating out over what I can only assume would be like an hour, an hour and a half. The procedure from PubChem that um, both me and uh, both uh, Rodonide and I are looking to um, for the synthesis uh, calls for three liters of water rather than 700. Um, no, I, I don't think it was three liters. It was 2,500. Uh, 2, but still, it's, it's an absurd amount of water. And um, in that case, it took them something like four hours to begin the precipitation and it lasted like 24. I, I've i gotten the precipitate to come out within two at max. And um, if anything um, doesn't come out in an hour, I would put it in the fridge and it should all come out. Um, if not, agitate it and it should. But I'll leave you with the time lapse. This compound acts very unique for a um, for a compound that's so densely nitrogen, um, and you, you can see uh, right here as a match right underneath it. You would think would detonate uh, such a nitrogen-rich compound, but no, it just it just kind of poofs and. Um, It, it does have a, a, a few um, amino groups on it, uh, the molecule does, uh, and that might explain for the, uh, for the less dramatic um, energetic properties, but what I find about this compound is it, it's kind of fun to play with because it, it really never detonates. And because it doesn't detonate, um, my intro is actually tetrazine. Um, so if you look back to that, there's a significant quantity of tetrazine in that uh, in that shot, and um, it all deflagrates within the span of maybe uh, a second at most. And um, it, it's interesting. It's it's like a flash powder, but no metal, um, no metal oxides are in the smoke. A direct flame test yields similar results to a flame, uh, well, to a, um, uh, to heating from underneath the compound on some foil. Uh, as you can see, it does the same thing. It poofs into a cloud of smoke. Uh, I would say the direct flame burns a little bit slower than when heating from underneath. But um, uh, when it comes to heating in a contained test, uh, you'll see that that really doesn't matter. As you can see, the compound does have the capacity to detonate under certain circumstances. Uh, these circumstances vary with its uh, uh, degree of wetness, dampness, um, but it does have a relatively low uh, capacity for friction and shock, so it, um, it is quite sensitive in those manners. Um, another reason not to make um, a, a more than a few grams of this um, compound at a time because it, it's imp uh, it's unpredictable in that manner uh, but in terms of um, 
sensitivity to heat. It's very similar to other energetics. Um, there's really no other way I can put it than that. All in all, I feel that Tetrazine really stands out in its group of, um, uh, in its closest family of chemicals, um, the tetrazole compounds, uh, as being a chemical that really doesn't uh, perform as an explosive um, unless you really want it to. So it, in that manner, it, I, I could see it potentially being used as some sort of solid propellant rocket fuel um, for small scale rocketry. Uh, in, in the next video, I might look into that, just some tinfoil rockets, um, maybe being propelled by some tetrazine. Who knows, I, I could maybe throw some, um, uh, one of these other compounds like so uh, the um, silver nitro tetrazole on the end and make a little report after shoots off flies through there a little bit uh, a little bow rocket or something like that that'd be kind of cool but uh that's that's it for this episode hope you guys enjoyed um, if you guys do want to follow this procedure um, and try it out yourselves using vinegar feel free to go right ahead uh, but I hope it works for you guys as, it, as well as it worked for me and see you next time